Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. I've got quite a few um, people that have asked questions over the past sort of few weeks in the comments section, and um, you know I put an answer in the comments section. And on reflection, those questions might be better asked generally, so that everybody gets the answer. If you see what I mean. Um, so the idea today is um, first of all. Um, Kit. If I'm going to talk about temperatures and stuff, um, my heater is just a little oscillating fan heater, although I don't actually let it oscillate because it makes horrible squeaky noise, which drives me up the wall in the evenings when I'm sitting quietly. Um, but it's just a, I mean, it's a three kilowatt um, electrical fan heater, so it obviously has a drying effect on the air, um, number one, but there's no flame involved. Um, any type of flame that's used to produce heat also produces um, carbon dioxide, um, which certainly isn't bad for the plants. It ain't so good for the humans, but, you know, <laughs> certainly in concentration anyway. Um, but plants need that, um, so, you know, that's not a bad thing. But if you use flame of any description, it needs to be clean. Yeah, if there's any yellow in your flames, you are giving off toxic fumes, basically, which won't be so good for your orchids. So, uh, <coughs> my easiest way um, is to have an electric heater. Expensive to run, but it's not on long. It's on a thermostat, and um, basically my minimum temperature that I maintain during winter, during the night, is 12 degrees C. And... Um, a thermostat kicks that heater on at 12 degrees C and raises the temperature up to about 13 and a half, maybe 14 ish. Yeah, and then the heater shuts off. So it's only actually on for about two minutes, literally, because um, it's, it's powerful, it's three kilowatts. So um, in a couple of minutes, it brings the temperature up. And then on a really cold night, it would take about 15, 20 minutes to drop down again and the thermostat would kick back in, it would come on for another couple of minutes. So if you add that up through the night time, you know, that's, that's the amount the heater's on. And it doesn't equate to a lot of electricity overall. And at the end of the day, this is my hobby. You know, my orchid collection is precious to me. Um, so I need to keep it alive during the winter. Those low temperatures are specifically for my resting dendrobiums and I would say probably about a half to two thirds of the plants in here are quite happy with that as a nighttime temperature during the winter. There are some in here that put up with it and there are some in here that really don't like it. It's too cold. They have to lump it, I'm afraid, because I can only average. Yeah, so that. And um, basically now it's daytime, the door's wide open which means the house is nice and warm and toasty, because I'm still not exactly 100%, so I don't need to get cold. Um, blow the plants, me first. If I'm not well, the plants don't get looked after. You know, it goes around in circles. <laughs> so, um, basically, as soon as it starts to get light, I'm usually up long before that, this time of year anyway, um, as the house gets comfortably warm and everything I open the door a little bit and some of that heat from the house starts coming out here and then a bit later in the day the door is wide open yeah so the heat is not required during the day um, with that door open what are we up to yeah, we're nearly up to 20 degrees C uh, and that's without any heating now that's just residual heat from the house floating in here and doing its thing and today we are going to get a bit of sunshine, although it's a gap in the clouds. I don't know how long it's going to hang around. And this time of year, I really do have to be careful with that sun because it will raise the temperature in here as it gets stronger, as we head towards proper spring. It's getting stronger and it starts earlier in the day. So it stays there longer before it hides behind the tree. Now, even though the tree's got no leaves on it, it, the branches filter the sun quite dramatically and it cuts the heat down. So, but, I, you know, my amount of time that that sun is on this end glass is now getting longer. Yeah, and the sun's getting a bit higher in the sky. So, you know, uh, it's coming to the time where the first lot of shade netting will have to go on here. But it'll only go up so far because I still need my resting dendrobiums to get that really bright light. 
they haven't all triggered their blooms yet so I'll just put the shade netting about two-thirds of the way up that glass and that will protect some of those that you know things like my um, the Paphiopedalums, Restrepias, Mastervalias and um, some of the cooler growing on Sidiums that don't mind the bright light but they don't want the heat on their leaves you know so that shade netting stops that happening so that's the way the temperature is controlled in the winter there's a phase called heading into spring where this starts to change and um, certainly as the dendrobiums are forming their buds I don't need those nighttime temperatures quite as cold so in mild weather the heater won't come on because when I go to bed I'll open the door you see what I mean so the residual heat from the daytime will fin filter into here overnight um, but if it's still going to be cold weather outside, despite this lot being double glazed, it's going to chill down in here. So I have to leave the heater there just in case. So I don't want it dropping down too low. So that's the way the heat works. Um, that's the heat temperatures. So nighttime temperature minis minimum on a thermostat is 12 degrees C for me. Too cold for some, <clears throat> but not too many. Rhinco stylus, uh, psychopsis. Um, some of my um, Phalaenopsis, the Japonica is okay, that'll put up with it. And a couple of my Bulbophyllums are warm growers, they're not happy in the cold. My Latorias and mm, put up with it, but they're not happy. They would grow better if it was warmer at night. Um, but apart from that, things like the Oncidiums and stuff, they'll, they'll be fine down at those temperatures. Cattleyas would prefer it a little warmer, but they don't mind. You know, so it, it averages and it, it doesn't work out too bad. It's, it's evolved over the years to that point. I mean, when I first got a number of resting dendrobiums and they weren't blooming, I was only letting the temperature go down to sort of 15 degrees at night, which was costing me a lot more in heating, and it, it didn't chill them quite enough. So although I might have got a few blooms, I, I wasn't getting what I called a good blooming and I had to keep dropping that temperature down to where it is now and this is the second winter where that's been the minimum temperature and it's done the job. And nothing's died from the cold. Things have stopped growing and are not happy, but they're alive. And come the better weather, they'll start growing again. So, you know, it's an average. So that's the heat. Um, Humidity you've already seen. Now during the winter time, unless we get a really crystal clear sunny day and the temperature starts to climb, there's more than enough humidity out here. So there's no artificial humidity needed during the winter under normal circumstances. Just watering the plants, especially the mounts, gets humidity in here. And at 20 degrees or less, quite honestly, 60% humidity is more than enough. Um, that's fine. Once you start getting above 20 degrees, you have to start thinking about, you know, hang on. I mean, on a sunny day this time of year, I'll get up to 25 degrees in here, and 60% for me is too low. So the foggers will start kicking in to take it up to 70 at that temperature, don't forget. Yeah? It's relative humidity. Um, at 20 degrees, the humidity reading you get if you don't do anything to the air and you raise the temperature to 25 degrees, that 60% humidity will drop down, probably less than 50%. There's n the, the amount of moisture in the air hasn't changed, it's just the way it's measured has changed. And I like to bump up the humidity to go with the temperature. So that's that lot. And most of the other questions about are about watering mounts and stuff, which I now have to do. So I'm going to have a bit of a clear up. As you can see, it's cluttered in here. Um, I mean, yesterday we had a bit of heat in here, so I actually got the big fogger in here. That only came on for 10 minutes and did the job. And the door was shut. So one, again, once the humidity's in here, you don't have to keep topping it up, it just stays. So I got that out. That went on for about 10 minutes, raised the humidity. Um, I, de I got up to about 25 in here yesterday, but only for a short spell. It was only for a couple of hours. So, you know, not the end of the world. So that was that. And then um, I've got my Vanda bucket, and I've now got that. So I've now got two large objects on the floor, plus a Cymbidium that... Well, gone again. Clivia, I'll get there in a minute, and, and the big bush. I'm starting to get... So that I've got a job to walk around in here. 
So, you know, I've, I've got to have a think about things. The Cymbidium will come up on a shelf soon because it's not far off coming into bloom. The Clivia might actually go into the house when it comes in bloom so that I can enjoy it. And a lot of people keep those as house plants, so that'll get rid of two biggies. There's not much I can do about this, but when I'm watering, I just take the big bush in on the dining room table. As I said, this poor orchid spends half its life in the house on the dining room table in the shadows, <laughs> simply because it's in the way. Um, but it's blooming, it's got buds on it, so it's doing okay, it doesn't mind it, you know. So anyway, I'm going to start watering the mounts and um, carry on chatting. I'm going to set the tripod up because I haven't really got time. I, I, and quite honestly, pictures tell the story. It's much easier to show people how I water my mounts and talk about it as I do it than it is trying to describe it. So um, I've got to have a clear up. Stuff on the floor needs to go. Big bush out the way. Um, heater just picks up and goes in there out the way. I have to pick the table up get the fan in there out of the way um, so that my table's clear and I've got a clear line of sight for the uh, camera on the tripod. So I'll get that set up and then we'll get going. Okay, just a quick bit on this. Um, during the winter time, my mounts, apart from the resting dendrobiums, do get some feed and I keep a historical record going back about five events, if you see what I mean. So, I'm, so I can look back over what they've had over the last five watering shall we say and um, in the winter the feed is light and I mean light I'm literally down at about 130 parts per million um, as we get into the growing season that level will rise and so will the frequency that they get fed at the moment they get fed twice not necessarily with the same thing then they get a flush because they're not growing much so it's a light feed and just having a look, um, the last time they were fed, they had a light feed with some added seaweed. So by keeping a record, I now know that I don't want to add any more seaweed for around three weeks. Irrespective of the number of waterings, I don't want that stuff going in there too often. It can, um, too much of it can have an adverse effect. Uh, the, um, a, a small amount now and again has a really good effect. So I'm happy to use it, but they're not getting too much of the stuff. Um, now that's my feed, you've all seen it before, it's the MSU formula, I doubt if you can read that. Um, that's not the point, what I did want to do, it's a very rare event, I'm going to open it. And this will be open for seconds, because this will suck up moisture out of the air as fast as anything. But this has a reason for showing you, <laughs> dented it. Um, let's see if I can get it so that you can at least see. You can probably see enough to see that you've got all different sorts of granules in there, of different sizes, yeah, and some powder. Now, if I was to use a quarter of a teaspoon for my feed, do you think I would get a balanced feed? What would a quarter of a teaspoonful be like? It could be nearly all powder and hardly any granules. It could be nearly all granules and hardly any powder. So I'd have, I wouldn't have a clue what I was feeding my plants with. Get the lid back on. So, having had discussions with, uh, so it needs to be done up tight, with the main man, Ray, from First Rays. I had a long chat with him via emails over quite a period. And he's quite happy that his stuff, not that he makes it anymore, will mix up as a stock solution and last for a nice long time as long as it's kept cool and dark. Well, keeping it dark is easy. <laughs> Just put it in a black bowl. Um, so that has about five scoops added to it. And by adding that quantity, you must appreciate it's reasonably obvious that I must be getting close, if not spot on, to the actual analysis on the pack. Whereas a quarter of a teaspoon just wouldn't do the job. So that's the reason for the stock solution. Yeah? If I was using four or five gallons of water each time I watered, I would just add the product direct. Because I'd be adding quite a bit. But the small amounts I use, no. Now, I've got a bit of a problem this time. This is a new batch. So I don't know how strong it is. <laughs> And this is the only time I will make this mistake if I make it. So I've got the amount of water I think I need, probably a little bit more, because what I don't want to do is run out before I've finished. And then that will get a sploop. 
just a sploop. Now that could be too much and I might have to add some more water. But if it's not too much over what I want, it'll do. It doesn't have to be that precise, it really doesn't. Make sure it's mixed up nicely. And make sure the water's still. Why do I need to make the water still? Because when I dip my meter in, if it's still slopping around, it will go up over the uh, watermark and get into the electrics. That is a cheap TDS meter. I think they're about 10 quid. I've had that at least five years. It hasn't gone off calibration and it's still working and it's still got its original batteries in it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you can pay a lot of money for a, a micro Siemens type meter. Trust me, you can pay 60, 70, 80 quid for one of those things. Do we need to be that accurate for our orchids? Probably not. Oh, what I guess. <laughs> Remember I just said somewhere around 130, maybe 150. That's coming out at... 145. That'll do nicely. So that's that done. Put that away. Now we have a slight bit of faffing. Because the little pH meter I've got is a cheapy one. But if you're going to get a cheapy pH meter, there are two types generally available on eBay. One of them hasn't, they're both, they're all yellow. Some of them are blue, but same thing basically. This one has a button on the front that says on off and a button that says cal for calibrate. There are others that look very similar that have got an on off switch on the top and trust me I went through three of them and dumped the lot of them. One of them didn't even work out of the box. They don't seem to be as good as these. First one I ever had of those lasted two years and it was still working fine and the reason I had to replace it was the um, you won't be able to see that, there's not enough light. But inside there is a little glass bubble that does the job. And it had a black mark on it, so I actually put my finger in there and tried to rub the black mark off and put my finger through the glass. So I broke it, yeah, so I had to replace it. And I got one with the on-off switch, took it out of the packet, didn't even work. In a constant reading of the water it was in, it was fluctuating between about eight and five <laughs> and it wouldn't keep still so it was obviously failing to work so, so I got a refund for that got another one and that wasn't very good and then I thought well let's just try one more and as I was looking for that one I noticed that there were some different ones and I thought well let's try one of those they, even though they look very similar and I got this one calibrated it and it's been fine ever since you know I mean these, these are about 10 quid they're really not a lot of money so if it only lasts a year it's not a big deal, but again, you can pay a lot of money for a pH meter. Now that one sits in there for a minute or two. The only thing with these types of pH meters is they're relatively slow to respond. Um, so by standing in the, them in some of your feed water, they get ready to give you an accurate reading. So the, the drop from what it was to what it is now will take place in that little glass of water while I have a slurp. And I suspect with that amount of feed, the pH is going to come out at about 6.8, I suspect. You get used to your own stuff at the end of the day. And these need a little bit of a sloshing around to help them take an accurate reading. Make sure the bulb is covered in whatever you are trying to read. Yeah. Oh, it's actually quite high. Oh, I know why that's quite high. Um, I added water to some that was already in there and if you leave RO water exposed to the air the pH will rise it takes something in from the air because RO water is pure it's hungry and I think it takes some um, carbon dioxide in out of the uh, air basically which is why I keep mine in sealed containers okay so that's got me a reading of about 7.1 far too high so Get the lid on that. That can go back out in the hall in the cool and dark. This, hang on, let me get it. Somebody's going to say, <laughs> <laughs> don't show it. If I do show it and you're not interested, you can skip on a bit. But um, I bought this citric acid. It's crystals and it was 1.99, I think. And um, it's still full. 
I've been using that a year and a half. That will last longer than I will, trust me. And by keeping it sealed, it stays in granular form. If it gets damp, it will go solid. All right? So in there is some RO water and probably about a quarter of a teaspoon of those granules to make a stock solution of citric acid. Citric acid is a pH down. There's no harm to the plants in the sort of quantities I'm going to use. And with this one, I do actually have a, a percentage of measuring. Because if I put too much in and it drops too much, I won't be happy. So we'll put a bit of that in, a bit of stir, and then we'll have another look. And I suspect this time it will, because it started at seven, a bit over seven, it's probably with that amount of uh, citric acid only gone down to about six, eight. Again, swizzle, swizzle, swizzle. And eventually the reading will settle. And of course, I'd forgotten that I'd actually mixed up a, a new, new batch of the citric acid as well, which is obviously a bit stronger than uh, under normal circumstances. I've got a feeling that's going to drop too low. Yes, it is. So that's gone down to 5.7. That's usable. Um, that's a little lower than I would like. Quite a few of my mounts that I'm going to water have got moss on them. And, you know, during the day, yeah, that's too low. Oh, that's good, because now I can show you the, uh, the alternative. Um, the batch of this that I've just mixed up is stronger than the last lot, so I need to re-educate myself to the amount I need to use to get a, a reading I want without having to faff around like I'm going to have to do now. The faffing around involves using some pH up. Now, I don't recommend you keep doing this, pH down, pH up, pH down, pH up, because you end up adding too much of stuff in there that's not feed. <laughs> you know, it's buffering. So, um, pH up, bicarbonate of soda. Probably already in your cupboard if anybody in the house bakes cakes or anything like that, yeah? If not, it's cheap as chips. But boy, is this stuff strong. So what I do is I wet my finger give it a good flick and touch that powder in there and I mean touch I'll show you in a minute that is too much that will probably take that pH back up to about eight or nine so I'm going to wipe some off until I've got a tiny amount that really is a tiny amount wash my finger off and that may have taken it back up too high it's, it's incredibly strong stuff, that bicarb. Well, it is as far as the effect it has on pH, anyway. But as I said, I'm working with new stuff at the moment, because I've mixed up new batches of everything, so it'll take me a couple of goes to get used to what's going on, at which point I'll probably be able to guess it spot on first go. I don't want to play with this too much. That's gone up to 6.2 and it's still climbing. Six three, still climbing. Six four. Now it's slowed down. So I think that'll do for this watering. That's so in my notes. I will now update that this watering was a TDS reading of 145 parts per million and a pH of 6.4. So that next time when I water, I'll be happy for the pH to be, you know, sort of 5859. Swing the pH, alternate the sort of feed that your orchids are getting because different things are absorbed at different uh, pHs. I'm not going into that today, it'll be here all flipping day. So that's got my stock water ready to use. Now I'll move the camera and we'll get out and actually use it, which is what you wanted to see, I suspect. Okay, I'm obviously not going to film fit, uh, watering every single mount. The principle's the same. <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, but what I do is, because this is the bowl that is used for watering, this gets sterilised before each session. And basically it gets a little bit of a scrub, um, a rinse, and then I pour boiling water in it and swill it round. Um, being very careful for it not to slop over the top on my hand, because it's boiling water and it goes, ouch, 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 I have done it. 
<laughs> I've also got it on my feet. <laughs> um, that sterilises that. The other bowl only ever has clean water and feed in it, but that gets sterilised every now and again as well, just to make sure everything starts off nice and clean. I also sterilise that and this sometimes, so, you know, I, I try and keep things as clean as possible, but one thing I don't recommend is I do share water, and if you can get away with not sharing water, then don't. By all means, I recommend not sharing water, but I do. But to de-risk cross-contamination in any shape or form, that stock solution we just mixed up, I use a little bit at a time. You see what I mean? There's only a bit in here, and then I can start watering. And this lot always get first, done first, because where they drip doesn't matter. They don't drip anywhere near other plants or near any electric, so they can go straight back up. And literally, watering is just pouring water over them. It's not exactly rocket science. But if you're doing a mount, don't forget to check round the back of the mount, because sometimes your roots will head off into the rear of the mount. Make sure they get some as well. Now, at this time of year, this is every three days. And if we get cold days with no sun whatsoever, they can go four days. We're now getting to the time of year where that frequency has got to be stepped up a bit. It's like the sun has actually come out today. If I get two sunny days on the trot, then I'll only leave a two-day two gap this time of year. Um, probably in about five or six weeks, these will be getting watered every day. And the only time they won't get watered every day is when we get consecutive dull days. And I can have a day off then. <laughs> Not that I want the dull days, but it does give me a day off. Um, no point in keeping them soaking wet. They still need a wet-dry cycle. Virtually everything that's on a mount is happy with a wet-dry cycle. You notice I'm watering this without pouring it on the plants. I'm only pouring it on the root areas, not the plants. Come the warmer weather, I'll be chucking water all over it, plant and all, because they will dry quickly. But not this time of year, I try and keep the plants dry. <coughs> and just make sure the roots go green. When they're green, they're wet. That's that one. Now that's the Lodigesii kikis. Um, that's a resting dendrobium, and although that's not been watered for a while, I'm not putting feed on it, so that can just wait. This is a little uh, Latoria type, I think. Tetragonum. Um, and this is pushing out new growth, so this has come back into active growth now, so this will appreciate some feed. And again, not all over the plant, not this time of year, just around the root area, and the moss, check round the back, we've got roots round the back, make sure they get watered as well. And just keep going basically until you see the roots change colour. And you will find, much to my annoyance because they're a nuisance, there are some plants that push out new roots and they will not turn green. <coughs> Excuse me. It's what I call new root syndrome. <laughs> I've just made that up. But they seem to have to age before they will turn green with immediate water. Um, some of them do it straight away on the new roots, a lot of the catrias do. But some, it's like this lovely new root here. It's not going green, and if I chucked it in a bucket and left it to soak for 15 minutes, it still wouldn't go green. But as it ages, it will. But there's more than enough roots in the moss for the moss to stay wet and hydrate the plant. So I'm not that fussed. Worried not. Now this little plant has no moss at all. It's a little Arengus. Well, I'll get a bit closer so you can see what I'm doing. And straight into the dark. Um, this is just roots on a mount. So there's no ability for that plant to stay wet any longer than it takes for those roots to dry off. So again, you can see most of those roots are white, some of them have got a bit of algae, so they've got a greenish tinge to them. You start pouring water on these, and they go quite green quite quickly. So this plant is hydrating really well. But there's about five roots on this plant that will not go green. 
And they are the shiny new roots. But I've noticed that one of those shiny new roots is starting to just, just starting to go green when I water it. So just make sure they're all done. Any aerial roots that are heading off the mount, make sure they get watered. If you miss them out frequently, they will dry up. You know, the root tip will stop growing and the root will start to die back because it's not getting enough hydration. If you've got 90% humidity, it might not happen. And then it can have other problems. So you can see the colour change on that. It's quite dramatic. That's now watered. Just back up where it goes. Now this little thing is too small to only water the root, so it, the plant has to have it as well, whether it likes it or not. It's not really growing a lot at the moment, I must admit, so uh, not doing a lot. And then we've got two little, these are two of the new telumnias, and um, I'm quite pleased to say, although you probably won't be able to see that because of the light level, this one is starting a new root system, just literally in the last week. It's just starting some nice little new roots coming out. So this one's on the mend. That set of five that I got at the Christmas do, um, none of them had new roots, and some of them didn't really have any roots worth talking about. But most of them had just enough old roots to keep them going, bearing in mind it's winter time, they're not growing that much, and it's cold. So they haven't got the heat. But as soon as the daytime temperatures start building, these are going to start growing. Now this one has more older roots and hydrates quite nicely, but it still hasn't started any new ones. Oh, I'm keeping my eye on it. So that's that one. And the last one on this rack has quite a bit of moss on it, and this is old moss, I think. But I got a horrible feeling, I actually remounted that because of where it was, it was growing wrong. So I'm not sure that is old moss, that might be zombie moss, you know. <laughs> We've all heard of this, when you use that um, dead sphagnum moss out of the bag, um, it's supposed to have been treated in such a way that it's dead once and for all, you know, you can't kill anything twice. Um, but it, with batches that seem to be coming around the various growers, some of it's coming back to life, which is hence the name zombie moss, and it starts growing. Um, obviously if it stays dry too long it'll die again. But uh, it looks like there may be some spores or something left alive in that stuff nowadays. <laughs> and it's actually coming back to life. Now, although I'm watering mounts, there are a couple of things that I always look at. This little dendrobium dries very fast. And it's supposed to stay moist. So uh, that one will get a little bit while I go past it, even though it's not a mount. The way it's actually growing, it's, it's more like a mount than in a pot. It's in a very shallow tray with live moss, not sphagnum moss, um, a different type of moss, don't ask me what, just some moss I collected off the bottom of a tree. And then I just drain that one out so it's not sat in water. The holes in the bottom of that tray don't work very well. Right, so that's it. That's the methodology, and um, the only difference now is, um, well, I'll do, do a few more I suppose. Um, this is my japonica. There's a nice spike pushing out there. Um, it didn't grow well in a pot. Um, I'm not sure I could call it growing well now, but by being on a mount, I get more control over where I put it. And this one has quite reasonable roots. And will they grow green? Will they hell? No matter how much water I put on this or how long I soak it, the roots don't go green. So I'm relying on the fact that some of the roots have got moss around them and they can take their time. And that one lives down low. That's a cool grower. Now that I know that, it might actually grow a bit better. <laughs> um, another little phalaenopsis. The difference. This one, as soon as you pour water on it, the roots go green. This one hydrates lovely. Well, that japonica won't. Maybe that's why it wasn't doing so well in the pot, because the, the roots take quite a long time to absorb the moisture. And um, because they weren't absorbing the moisture in the pot very quickly, the pot was staying wet too long. Whereas on a mount, you know, what it doesn't absorb, it just evaporates. Um, 
Let me just see. Yeah, now that's down to next to nothing now. I'm struggling to get some in the glass. So I'll have a top up. There's a big one. And then I'll do a big one. This is hibiki. I don't want to look at this plant too closely because I'm about to do my updates and this is one of our project plants. But as you can see, new growth, first new growth, now bigger than previous growths and quite a lot of new growth coming. Actively growing, vigorously growing. So this level of feed for this one is probably a bit low. But I'm not having three or four different types of feed as I go round. So you'll have to lump it. And so far, you know, no damage done. It's still growing, it's pushing out new roots. But this one's got a lot of moss. And therein lies the difference. It's a vigorous grower. So by having a lot of moss, it stays wet longer and gets a lot longer to absorb the nutrients before it all dries off. Then we have to start finding places for them to drip on the floor because we don't want uh, them dripping on plants, which they would do. Now this one's got a lot of aerial roots because some of the growth on this is actually kikis. They're not from the base of the plant, they're from slightly higher up but the roots headed down to the mount. So although those are, that's a kiki, it can stay on the plant as part of the plant on the grounds that the roots are onto the mount. If the roots stayed aerial and didn't get near the mount, I'd probably take it off and uh, treat it as a separate plant. Again, this is actively growing and has been all through the winter, but it will have been growing slower in the winter, probably because of the cooler nights. Who knows, this might even be one that likes the cooler nights. Actually it would be, come to think of it, wouldn't it? This is Kaneko, which um, currently has some new buds coming. Yeah? Um, and that's got uh, Goldschmittianum, which I know nothing about, but it's also got Victoria Regina in it. Uh, and as such, it's a cool grower, which is probably why it's been growing so well in the winter. <laughs> uh. Right, what else? Um, uh, a, a more vigorous Tolumnia. This is one of the uh, ones I've had a while. Um, the idea of looking at this one before I stop is to look at what a mature root system on a Tolumnia should look like. It should be a massive tangle of roots. And it will be a combination of older looking ones that are a bit brown. Nice shiny white ones, yeah? But they grow an extensive root system as they mature. Um, this one's just opened now, so that, that's a new opening, that's Tolumnia Peach. But that's quite a mature plant now. Um, it's pushing up quite a few new fans at the same time. A nice new one down underneath here, this one here, and the one behind it that's blooming. Another one just starting round here. Yeah? And once you get them to that stage and they start pushing out quite a few fans at the same time, you're highly likely to get more than one spike at the same time. But they, uh, they grow quite quickly. Tolumnias can mature from a single fan, probably taken off a bigger plant to sell on, um, and they can mature with three or four fans in less than a couple of years. Feed, feed and water well in the summer. <laughs> Don't keep the roots soggy or you'll kill them. So you can see with this one, there's a reasonable amount of moss, but a lot of the roots are just bare on the mount. So that's an average. It means that in the summertime, I can still get away with watering once a day because that will stay wet for a good part of the day, giving it plenty of time to hydrate. Whereas these roots here will be dry in an hour, and that would not hydrate it enough. Okay? Right, that'll do. So that's just uh, some examples of what I get up to when I'm watering the mounts. We did a one like this with me in it doing the pots. Now I've done the mounts. Um, the holy clay pots are exactly the same as a normal pot. Pour water in the top, pours out the bottom. So no difference. So that's methodology and some of the logic about how much moss, why, and um, yeah. So, so that's it. Um, hope you enjoyed that. That's a whole session talking about the feed. Um, parts per million that I've done. We had a chat about the temperatures and how I control it in the winter. 
these are all questions that are built up trying to hit the lot in one go basically which I hope I've done and um, now I need to get on and crack on and do the rest of the watering because if this sun's going to stay out the temperature is going to start to climb and I need the fans on and at the moment one of the fans is in the lounge and um, you know I, I need to get I need to get cracking now so I'll get this posted later today hope you've enjoyed it and uh, see you next time